<clears throat> You're welcome to the online class. This is GST 105, History and Philosophy of Science, Model 1, Unit 2 for the National Open University of Nigeria and the student. Uh, we've looked at uh, Model 1, Unit 1 in the uh, previous uh, class. And uh, so in this class, we'll be looking at uh, uh, Unit 2. Of course, we have uh, five units in uh, Module 1. We're through with uh, Unit 1 in, uh, in uh, the last previous uh, video. We'll be looking at scientific method in this uh, uh, session. OK, uh, scientific method of acquiring knowledge. We've said earlier that science is a collection of facts, body of knowledge that describe and explain the workings of nature, right? Like I said earlier, that if, when, you, when you are looking at science, just imagine the ocean, okay? Look at the Atlantic Ocean, uh, or, you know, for example, okay? So you look at uh, all manner of uh, seas, uh, all manner of uh, rivers, you know, uh, merging together, coming together from all parts of the world to form an ocean. And if you look at an ocean, look at diverse animals, diverse uh, plant diversity, diverse uh, mineral resources and so on, you can see it in an ocean. And that is how science is. All manner of knowledge from various fields all right, physics, biology, astronomy, all right, astrophysics, just mention it, all right? So the, the examinement of science lies in the, in, in the intriguing observation and the carefully designed experiments that scientists have devised to help us to learn about nature, all right? So scientists have developed senses and not only developed senses, they also have instruments by which uh, they can be able to gather facts, to gather knowledge about the, the, our surroundings, both immediate and far away. Now, this is very important. This is steps um, of science, scientific method of acquiring knowledge, six steps of, um, of the science. Number one, observation. Number two, problem definition. Number three, hypothesis formulation. Number four, experimentation. Number five, conclusion. Number six, theory formulation. These are the six stages of uh, that every discovery you have seen that has ever existed. These six stages are what uh, they have to, the scientists have to go through before those, um, those uh, discoveries or those theories. Uh, who, have, who have formulated and seen and agreed to be correct. So science, scientific uh, discovery starts with observation, all right? Uh, so noticing resemblances and recurrences in the events that happen around us, you know, what we call sequence, patterns, all right? And because of those sequence and patterns, you can actually be able to say, oh, well, if this is the law, Okay, every morning the sun rises, every evening the sun sets. It's, a, it's, it's an observation. Okay, it's an observation. Okay, in the night, every night the moon comes up. It's an observation. Okay, so observation is the first step of the scientific method. All right, scientific observation can be both direct and indirect. For the examination, you should not, not take note of that. Scientific observation can be direct and indirect. So what is direct observation? Direct observations are made with the aid of the senses, right? Just like the, the sunrise, I give an example, right? That's direct observation. So if you wake up early enough, right, you can actually watch the sun rising, okay? And if you stay late, of course, in, in outside, you can also see the sun setting. That's direct observation. Then you have indirect observations, which are performed with the aid of the instruments. Right. Can you see uh, amoeba with your, with your eyes? 
you know, with us, super high, not possible. All right, can you see uh, a virus with your physical eye? No, you cannot. So you have to, you have to use microscope. Okay, we all know that there is a planet called Mars, right? Confirmed. Okay, but can you see that with your physical eyes? No, you will need a telescope, all right? Maybe in uh, the space center in Abuja, or if you are lucky in NASA in US. Okay, so that is indirect. Uh, observation, observing with the aid of instruments, all right? Observ observations can also be classified as spontaneous or passive observation, which, which are unexpected. Let me give a very good example. The law of gravitation was, um, was, uh, was uh, discovered by Isaac Newton, all right? And he was just, he was under a, a tree, then a mango just fell. And as the mango fell, he just started thinking, and he said, why, how come, what made the mango to drop? All right, and that is how he discovered the law of gravitation. All right, and we have all manner of formulas, the physics for that. Today, it was a spontaneous or passive observation. All right, we led to something concrete, a theory. All right, then you have induced or active observations which are deliberately looked out for, right? So you have somebody that just, you know, had an idea that something could be and set out, right? To actually plan some, some of these things take years. Some of them even take generations, right? For scientists to be able to not get what they really want, okay? They may have been suspecting or guessing that this actually occurred, but they did not plan. Okay, uh, for example, um, maybe you're looking for uh, animals that are thought to be extinct. But well, scientists may just have an idea that maybe some of these animals are not really extinct, maybe they are, they are existing somewhere. So you have, you have people now uh, going all over the, the world trying to see, maybe going to the rainforest, mangroves, to go and search out those animals. Now that's, that's, that's active. Observation, deliberately setting up, deliberately looking for an information, right? Or you plan to go to the Arctic, like those scientists, those explorers, those days that go to the Antarctica. But I went to are not as bad as this, you know, climate change and everything. So they have eyes all over the place. So you see this competition to be uh, which individual, which country will first discover the secrets of the Arctic and the Antarctica. All right, so that is active observation, plan for deliberately looking out to get knowledge. So take note of that. Observation can be spontaneous or passive, it can be induced or active. So once you move from observation, all right, either spontaneous or induced, all right, uh, either direct or indirect, the next thing is that you now define the problem, problem definition. So in these steps, questions are asked about the observation. So what we have seen, now let's ask questions about it. Like I gave the example of uh, uh, Isaac Newton when that mango dropped, he observed it, right? And that now led, led to the question, what made the, what threw the mango from the tree to the field, to the ground? So that's problem definition. So for thousands of years, even curiosity simply took it for granted that any unsupported object that is thrown up in the air must fall to the ground. It took a genius, I suppose, and that's what I just said now, to ask how come. So before I just say, Mango just fell down, let me just take it back. But somebody now asked the question why is it that when you throw something up, it must come down? All right, one law, one law governs that, and that is the problem. Problem definition. So we look at our exercises as usual. Can you answer this? Uh, I could have provided the answer, but I will not. I want you to follow the, the tutor, um, tutorial. Observation can be classified into a dash or passive observation. All right? Remember, we said observation is to be on platform. So what is that? And dash or active observation. Okay? The number two. To be of value to science, a question must be dash or dash. So the answer is, of course, in the slides, 
So you may need to pause the video and go back. If you didn't, you cannot answer the two questions. All right, so let's move on. So from problem definition, you can now move to number three, hypothesis formulation. So we now start creating hypothesis, all right, uh, which is actually educated guess, right? You may be correct, you may not be correct. So uh, what guesses, what the answer to the question might be? So scientists call this assumed answer hypothesis, all right? So now that you have defined your problem, so what so the problem is what law makes a, 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 you know a mango to fall down or an orange to fall down from the tree to the ground what law makes uh, what i throw up to come down right but at that time we don't know the law it's not like today when we have all the answers all right so i think Bixi must have created so many hypotheses all right to answer that question, to, to solve that problem, okay? So the only way you will know that your answer is correct, your hypothesis is correct, is when you have experiments. That's why experimentation is a practical, all right? It's a practical side of it, all right? I remember when I was doing my chemi industrial chemistry projects, right? My project supervisor in organic chemistry does, he also wrote some equations, all right? And you know, as, as an organic chemistry professor, he was able to show how those chemicals should react in real life. All right, I could see it uh, on this on the on the on paper that these chemicals can bond to create another chemical. But the question now is how? What conditions? What conditions will exist before those the new compound? Which we call that uh, I think imite, all right? The, for the imite to be to be to be formed or to be created, that was a problem, and that was a problem I was supposed to solve. And so we have to be coming up with different hypotheses. So we get this hypothesis, we go to the lab and try it. It will not work. <laughs> you know, we have another hypothesis, all right? Uh, let's try uh, one gram of this with two gram of this at uh, forty degrees uh, centigrade. So it's an hypothesis. Which it is the only way we get to the to the lab experimentation that we really do. So we knock off so many hypotheses before we finally landed at the right one, and that was how I got uh, my A in my project. Okay, so the main function of the hypothesis is to predict new experiments or new observations. So, uh, like I said, hypothesis formulation. All right, is, is educated guess. You want to solve the problem you have defined. So you come up with different guesses and all those educated guesses, you take them to stage four, which is now experimentation. And that can be, you know, depending on the type of science, either social science or, um, or natural science. So the, what the experimentation will actually be. So experimentation can provide the necessary evidence and anyone who experiments after guessing that that has become truly scientific in his approach. So this is the toughest part of the scientific method. Like I just gave an example of my uh, organic chemistry uh, project, you know, in my BSc. So it was, so we, we just, we, we've never done that, that uh, reaction before. And so we have to be coming up with different uh, hypotheses the the under what conditions with those two chemicals will act to create what you want and so it took a lot of uh, you know try this it didn't work try that it didn't work try that it didn't work until finally you know we are able to to get the right condition like I still remember that that day to today how happy my professor was and he was so 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 happy in the laboratory that day when we saw those fine uh, crystalline material, you know, being created in the lab when we finally got it right. Experimentation. So from experimentation, we can now move to conclusions. But before we move to that, let's look at exercise 2.2. Uh, the main function of the hypothesis is to predict what? Dash, dash, or dash. So like I said, you should be able to answer that now. If you can't, pause the video, go back, then you come back to this question, all right? 
Uh, a scientific approach to explain various aspects of the natural world includes all of the following except hypothesis, A, B, testing, C, fate, and simple consensus, D, systematic observation. Of course, I'm sure you already know what the answer should be by now. You know, combining what we have taught in unit one and the unit two now, you should know well, what of, which of those does not belong. So like I said from experimentation, we cannot know what the hypothesis that is correct or not, or the one that is not correct. So we can actually conclude. So conclusions are made based on the results of the experiments. All right. Then now uh, we, we are we are not getting you know the facts now, scientific facts with evidence, so we can actually formulate a theory. All right. If you do this and this under this condition, this is what we will get. That's now the theory. So a scientific theory is an explanation about the cause or causes of a broad range of related phenomena. So a theory is usually proposed when a hypothesis has been supported by really convincing evidence. Don't forget we have gone, we've done experimentation. So we have facts. So it's not just theory. It's not just hypothesis, all right? This evidence must be obtainable in many different laboratories and by many independent researchers. So whether you are in uh, London, or you are in Nigeria, or you're in Ghana, or you are in uh, uh, Cote d'Ivoire, wherever you are, all right? Wherever you are in the world, once that theory is valid, we must all get the same results. So theories are open to tests, revisions, and tentative acceptance or rejection. All right, so that is the end of the uh, unit two. Don't forget what we said about the step of science. We start from observation, all right? From there, we define the problem. From there, we formulate hypothesis. Then we go to the lab, experiment, then we can write our conclusions, then we can formulate the theory. So uh, this is the end of uh, unit two. Uh, I will be presenting on unit three in the next video. If you have not subscribed to the channel, kindly subscribe now. Thank you.